Order! 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 You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Hello and welcome from us. This week, the EU and the city. And with me for the duration are Stephen Timms, Labour MP for East Ham, and Matthew Offord, Conservative MP for Hendon. Welcome up to you both. Thank and you. can we just start with quick first thoughts on the, the EU referendum debate so far? And, and Matthew, what's at stake for your constituents? What's at stake is for the future of the United Kingdom. That's the big issue. Um, we certainly want to, I want to come out of Europe. Uh, I believe that we can flourish, we don't need the European Union, and some of the measures and directives actually are stifling um, our economy. So I'd like to see us come out of the EU. Uh, are your constituents asking you th that question and how will it affect us locally and what do you say to them when they do that? Well they are asking me questions, um, how will it affect locally. Um, Things like, for example, uh, air quality. That's certainly an issue that um, DEFRA and the government are working upon. So we don't need Europe to tell us about environmental conditions because actually we've, we've got quite a good track record. I saw something recently that said um, we only have good bathing water around our coastline because of the EU. That's not actually correct. Um, it's something that the government's always been working upon and that won't change overnight if we decide to leave the EU. Stephen, what's at stake for your constituents? It's the jobs of my constituents above all that are at stake. Thousands of people living in, in my borough in Newham commuting into the city every day, working in financial services and if we were to leave the EU there would be a very big threat to many of those jobs. Do they see that? Do they understand that? Many do. I, I mean I, I talk uh, every uh, Saturday on my street stall in East Ham High Street to lots of people, uh, I would say there's a fairly even split at the moment between the, those in, in favour of uh, staying in and those who want to come out. But certainly the question of jobs weighs very heavily in people's minds. Uh, and what about, say, local investment or, or, or developments in your area? Well, there's a big project we're looking forward to, the Asian Business Port in the Docklands uh, in Newham. The plan is, it's a Chinese developer wants to provide European headquarters space for Chinese banks and others who want to address the European market. A great project, 30,000 jobs make a very big difference to us uh, in East London. The reality, I think, is that if by the time those companies choose whether to actually move in or not, we're no longer in the European market, then many of those companies won't come. That's the scale of the threat that we face two jobs in London if we were to leave the European Union. OK, well, that starts us off well. Let's, um, let's continue on uh, with that idea. Um, to critics, it's where the Great Recession started, but the bonuses never stopped. To its fans, it's the lifeblood of the capital. Where does the city stand on leaving the EU? And what would life look like if that happened? Andrew Cryan reports. Finance, London's biggest, most lucrative most controversial industry. Now lots of people watching this programme aren't going to be overly concerned with the future of a load of bankers, lawyers, hedge fund managers and all the rest of it. But there's no question that having financial services in London is one of the reasons the capital is the richest part of the UK, one of the very richest in the world. And that wealth spills over. So for example there's a construction site just up there, well that's giving jobs to electricians and plumbers. There's deliveries to be made, taxis to ride, there's pubs and shops and more. Many at the top of the city say that leaving the EU puts this whole ecosystem at risk. The City UK is the lobbying group for financial services big firms and say there's a large degree of agreement. We surveyed our membership and actually 84% of those who run major international firms want the UK to stay in the European Union. For 95% of them, it's mission critical to have access to the single market, and only 4% said that the UK should leave the European Union. There may be trouble ahead, but while Lloyds of London is the global hub of specialist insurance. Billions of pounds change hands here every year. They say that being part of the EU is one of the reasons for their success. Now one thing that nearly all city firms who want to stay in the EU have in common is they're concerned about something called passporting rights, which means they have the right to sell their products all across the EU in the same way that they would here in Britain. For we rely 
on the passporting rights that the EU provides us into the EU where we can treat the EU 27 member states effectively as one market or as a domestic market and secondly very importantly we trade with the benefit of the bilateral agreements that the EU have with other third party countries which are extremely important to us. But it's not just Lloyds who are worried. Banks like HSBC have said they'd move their staff abroad. Others have donated to the Remain campaign. And one estimate doing the rounds from accountancy firm PricewaterhouseCooper is that 100,000 financial services jobs could be lost by the end of the decade. But does all of this amount to what the Leave campaign like to call Project Fear? The idea that powerful forces are conspiring to make people afraid of voting to leave the EU, when the truth is, they say, that things will be absolutely fine. One man who thinks Project Fear is in full effect is Mark Littlewood, Director General of the Institute for Economic Affairs think tank. The United States of America sells in in financial services and insurance to the European Union, roughly speaking about the same proportion that the United Kingdom does. The USA has managed that without joining the single currency and without, as far as I'm aware, considering becoming a member of the European Union. So if the USA can achieve that on the outside, I don't see any reason to believe that the United Kingdom can't. I want to break free. And according to some of those who want to leave, when freed from the shackles of European regulation, we'll be able to run things in a way that much better suits our interests. The French have a veto over all um, regulation and legislation relating to agriculture. David Cameron went to Europe to try and negotiate a similar veto for, for, for financial services. And, uh, you know, they told him, no, he couldn't possibly have one. Money. But wherever the truth may lie, with financial services making up such a large part of the capital's economy, the impact of the referendum on this single sector could have huge implications, not just for the square mile, but the whole of the country. It's a well, joining the uh, discussion now, Ruth Lee, who uh, supports Leave, uh, an economist, and Mark Boliat, who's the political leader of uh, the City of London uh, Corporation and very much in favour of staying yourself and, uh, and the corporation. Uh, why and, and what do you think the worst scenario is of leaving? I think why is what John Nelson from Lloyd's has explained. It is access to the entire European Union market as if it is our domestic market. That is simply not possible from outside the European Union. Um, many businesses it's not relevant, but for a lot it is relevant, particularly the larger ones, and it would be the threat to jobs if we were not in the European Union. The worst case scenario is that Britain was outside the European Union with no access to the single market other than would be available to any other country. That, if we could negotiate continued access, continuing to have a say in the, world, in the rules, that would be, accept, well, not acceptable, but it would be the least worst outcome if we chose to leave. Ruth, what do you say to that? Well, I think the prospects for the City of London are very good whether we're in the EU or not in the EU. And I think if, if we did leave, then we'd be able to negotiate a very good agreement to have access, continued access, to the European markets. Axel Weber, who's the chairman of UBS, and he was a pro former president of the Bundesbank, has said that. He said that uh, Britain should get a, London should get a very favourable uh, agreement. And when it comes to passporting, and that was what the gentleman was saying at Lloyd's, I have little doubt that the British government would sit down with the other members of the European Union and agree some sort of regulatory equivalent system, which is a quasi-passport, which would continue trade very much as it is today. Well, how is it that all the major financial institutions and the big players and the big companies in the city are saying, you know, they want to stay? Well, the trouble is, we've been here before, you know, I'm, I'm a veteran, uh, somewhat a, a battered veteran of the Euro campaign, and I remember at the time how many times I was told, because obviously I was anti-Euro, for economic reasons, by the way, I was told that if we didn't go in the Euro, this would really damage the City of London. Well, phooey then and phooey now. And th well, I think one of the reasons why I think that the, the British and the, Europe, the other Europeans would negotiate it's a good agreement is it's in their interests and it's in the interests of the banks all the financial institutions the EEA or the e including the EU banks 75 of them are they here in London because London is the unique financial center in, in Europe they need the talent pool here they need the global reach here and if there were not a good agreement they would suffer and I don't think that's what they'd want or their governments uh, would want a lot of points there but mark you know fooey say and, and everyone keeps on citing the um, uh, 
uh, the, the euro come back on that? Indeed, I'm told that I apparently was one of these people, which I certainly wasn't. Um, well, some I've not people, said that. Uh, no, you haven't. <laughs> with, uh, um, some people may have said that it certainly didn't include the City of London Corporation, and I think that's a bit of a red herring. We're talking about whether Britain stays in the European Union or not, and indeed, if we could get the sort of arrangement that Ruth have described, two obvious points: why are we bothering to leave? Because actually, that's what we've got now. Um, any equivalence wouldn't be negotiated, it would have to be equivalent. That is, the European Union says this is what you have to do, Britain would have to do it. It would take years to achieve that. There would be uncertainty until we achieve that. If Britain votes to leave on the, the 23rd of June, then the assumption would be that we will not be in the single market with access to it until someone can demonstrate that that would not be the case, and that would take a, a period of time. Such a period of uncertainty, isn't and it? And there would be uh, uncertainty. Uh, about this equivalence, I mean, there's something called MIFID II that's coming in that's going to have equivalence provisions. And I don't want to get horribly technical, oh, but that's going, to, yeah. that's going to come I'm in. I'm lost already. <laughs> Most people are on MIFID <laughs> so am I. II. Uh, but no, j joking about, that's going to come in in January 2018. We are not going to be leaving the EU. 2019 2020 at the earliest so actually this system of equivalence that I was talking about will already be in place and why leave the EU I'm not leaving because of economic reasons I'm leaving because of democratic reasons what about do you recognize a figure do you recognize you know, PwC um, say that they think there could be a loss of about a hundred thousand jobs do you accept that I don't believe any of these figures quite honestly you know I always say that economic forecasting is there to make astrology look good and that <laughs> goes for uh, George Osborne's four thousand three hundred pounds you know hit on the household income etc etc etc. Well, fear on both sides of course if, if accept, we, as, a, if as, a, we, as an impartial economist yeah. looking down on the arguments here. <laughs> well I always not my own profession you know that but because I'm self-deprecating but more to the point if you believe that trade will continue very much as I believe that trade will continue then I don't see any reason why there should be there some jobs. The other thing to say of course where are the growth marks going to be for the City of London it's not going to be EU that is a stagnant market it's outside in the non-EU and that's where the growth and in future will come from. 100,000 jobs was a, was, was a kind of mm. uh, recommendation from, uh, from PwC or an estimate. Yes, Is yours at the corporation and the people you speak to higher, lower than that in that ballpark? Do you have serious fears for jobs? Uh, we haven't made an estimate. There's been a number of different studies on what the impact would be. I won't say they're exactly the same, but they're broadly similar. There would be an impact on jobs. The exact impact would depend on the terms that Britain it's could trade. negotiate. But at the very least, there would be a period of years of uncertainty no. before we would know what the arrangements no. were. The equivalence regimes, when they're negotiated, territory by territory, come in some years after the single market arrangement. We're, we're and a business cannot work on the assumption that it might turn... Or if, it might turn out all right. We'd already let me, let me bring, um, let me bring uh, the MPs in here. Let's bring our elected we're representatives <laughs> here at, at this stage. Uh, Matthew, Offit, I mean, you must have, you will have seen and known and fully understood the value of uh, of the city, not just to the capital, but to the country. Um, would you really want to take the risk? Well, you say there's a risk. There's, there's two points I wanted to make. Firstly, Ruth, absolutely right. This isn't just about big business. This is about us choosing our own democracy and deciding for ourselves what we want to do and how we want to uh, have our, our country governed. And the second point is, uh, Ruth also made, that the amount that we trade in from the city with financial services to Europe has reduced by over 7% in the last 10 years. And the amount that we trade with America is about the same amount. So actually, we shouldn't just be looking towards uh, Europe. We should be looking elsewhere, particularly with um, some of the emerging uh, uh, economies in different countries as well. I think there's a great opportunity there. So we would not need to be part of the EU. In fact, we'd be better if we weren't part of the EU so we can make our own decisions how we trade with these countries. Stephen, you take uh, another view. <laughs> I, I do. I think there's a huge risk to jobs here. Ruth makes the point that it'll take you know, two or three years until the arrangements for our departure are resolved. I think that's probably Thank right. You. And it's that uncertainty certainty in itself which is such a huge risk to jobs because who's going to invest in financial services in the UK if they don't know what the basis for their future uh, trading with Europe is going to be we won't know are we going to need visas to visit uh, France and Germany in the future are they going to need to apply to visas to visit us all these things we simply won't know and that'll mean people won't invest and we'll lose jobs but that's not entirely correct because the vice chairman of the Chinese Development Bank has said that he wants to invest it simply because 
Britain, the United Kingdom is closely aligned with Hong Kong. We're the center of the, the time zones between America and the Asian markets. And we have not only a pool of people, solicitors and other people, other professionals, who are able to work with the markets, and we have a good legal framework. But if they don't know for a few years what the basis will be for their ability to trade from the UK into Europe, they won't invest, they'll hold back. Yes. What about, do, do, doesn't remaining in the EU threaten, and the EU, some people put it like, EU will come after the city with more regulation in future, like financial transaction tax and, mm -hmm. and what have you? We're better off for that reason. Well, one of the things that d disappoints me about what this government has done about Europe is the reduction in the number of British civil servants working in Brussels. This government hasn't engaged sufficiently with the mechanisms of the Commission, uh, the Parliament and the Council. I think we will need, after the referendum, assuming we vote, as I hope we do, to stay in, we'll need to engage much more vigorously with those debates that are happening in order that we can deal with risks like that one, which would threaten us if, uh, uh, if changes were made that were damaging to our interests. But of course, if we come out of the EU, we won't any longer have any ability to shape those rules at all. The likelihood is we'll have to play by the rules still, so we'd be in a far worse position than we have been up till now. What's your thought about that? I'll bring you in again. Okay. What's your thought about that? Because actually, don't you sometimes secretly or quietly think how you know, brilliant or exciting, it could be untrammeled by any sense of danger of EU regulation. Well, I agree entirely with what Stephen said about the need to be better engaged, but we're going to be publishing some research tomorrow showing that actually we've done rather well in the negotiations on the various financial services initiatives. Often they start off as something that's not favourable to Britain, but we do a really good job, the civil servants do it, even with limited resources, and we get a good outcome. FTT is really interesting because we're not party to it. If it ever happens, and actually it's not going to happen in any way like the way it's been envisaged, we would be subject to it whether we're inside the EU or out because it would be supranational as our own stamp duty is. The fact is by being in the EU, even though we wouldn't be party to it, we can influence that debate. And also our own government has made it clear there would be no relaxation of financial regulation in the event of Britain not being in the European Union. Did David Cameron negotiate quite a good deal in terms of pres preserving the city's position? I don't think so, because basically they can just turn it down. Could I just pick up from Stephen's comment? He talks about uncertainty. I mean, I take your point, but as I've already said, MIFID uh, two is coming in in 2018, where, where you have equivalence, you have the equivalence pr provisions. So and all you need for a British government then is to say we will continue with these. And when it comes to visas, again, in the negotiations, Negotiations, I would trust and I would expect a British government to say what the situation was being, would well, be. Be because, quite honestly, they would say that because they know full well they don't want this sort of story Stephen, of uncertainty well, to go on. It, it, it can't, because the, 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 the reason mm. for coming out of Europe fundamentally is about immigration. Yes. To deal with immigration, we would have to have some sort of visa system, yes. and that would apply to us as well as to of those course. visiting. So if I have to want to visit Brussels, I'll need to apply for a visa. That will put businesses in an impossible position. No, we shouldn't and, do it. You, you, the British government at the time would surely say what they envisaged by way of the visas to give, a, and the, I think they'd give a very generous deal on that because but we don't they, know. But they would say that at the time. You can say you don't know now, but do you know in 2018 or 2017? The, the government would have already said that. The government would say it. A final word to Matthew and just say that do you accept and are you saying to people that there might be turbulent times and how long do you think there might be turbulence before everything, you know, got wonderful? As, as I said, I don't <laughs> think there will be turbulent times. Um, and we have also experienced that kind of uncertainty before, the time that we withdrew from the ERM. Not only did our interest rates reduce, our exports increased and our, our economy boomed. I see it happening the same again. OK, um, time marches on to you two. Um, I'd thanks love for to talk about did. this all afternoon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can detect that. But you can't. <laughs> Goodbye. Yeah. Thanks very much. <laughs> now for the rest of the news in 60 seconds. London boroughs are not enforcing affordable housing targets with developers. The Pan London yearly target for new units of affordable housing is 17,000, although councils set their own levels. Only 8,500 such units were built in developments with affordability requirements in 2015-16. Westminster Council has said it is facing significant financial challenges and may axe its fixed CCTV cameras in September to save £1.7 million in upgrade costs. The authority claims there is only limited evidence fixed CCTV cameras prevent crime and disorder. Labour Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, joined Prime Minister David Cameron this week 
to launch a Remain battle bus. Mr Cameron had previously criticised Mr Khan's poor judgement during the Labour mayoral election. However, on Monday they said they would work together in Londoners' best interests. I shared a joke about their father's very different careers. Uh, but Stephen, was Sadiq Khan right to share a platform, as some people joked, with that extremist, David Cameron? I, I think he was. I, it's clearly a huge issue for London whether or not we stay in the European Union for the reasons we've just been talking about. I think Sadiq, who's made a fantastic start as Mayor of London, which I really applaud, I think he's absolutely right to stand up for the interests of London and make the case for staying in the EU. But, but there's quite a few people in your party, perhaps right at the top as well, Deputy Leader doesn't appear to share. I, I, I think he, he's, Deputy Leader, he's right, right to take, sorry. Take, Shadow Chancellor. <laughs> I, I think Sadiq's right to take every opportunity to make the case for London. That's what he's doing. What did you think when you uh, see the Mayor of London there with um, the Prime Minister sharing well, the platform? The day after the election, uh, an ambassador whom I shall not name said uh, it was permissible to use any method, any technique to win an election. But after the election, you have to accept the result and the person who's elected, and I think that's absolutely right. I don't see Sadiq Khan as a Labour Member of Parliament, that he is no longer, or the Labour Mayor. I see him as Mayor of London, so he was right to do so. Right. And you support him as such as a London MP, unless he does something radically, you know, absolutely. awful to you locally, you Absolutely. Mean. Um, and what about this decision by Westminster Council? Now, I think they are the wealthiest authority, but certainly bang here in the middle of the capital, uh, with all the tourists and, and so on. They are uh, planning to, or look like they're going to scrap their CCTV system. I find it greatly worrying. Um, when I was a councillor in Barnet, we introduced CCTV in a regular rollout program, and not only did it help prevent fairly horrific crimes, including rape and, and possibly a, a, there was a murder, uh, and it worries me that in the capital city of London, that we no longer have not only deterrent against crime, but also it's a, a great tool in the fight against terrorism. Do people make over claims, those steam for, for CCTV? I mean, Westminster is saying it, it literally only gets involved, it's only involved in the solution uh, of, say, 2% of crime? Well, I, I think it's got a wider importance. I agree with Matthew about this. I've just had a public meeting with residents of my constituency. We've talked about rubbish fly tipping. Mm. And a lot of people want to see more cameras so that those who dump rubbish, dump mattresses, dump boxes of rubbish on the pavement, can be caught. So I'm surprised Westminster is doing well, this. Saying, I don't so they, they say it's, it's really very reactive and it's not not really a deterrent. Do you not accept that? I, I think it can be. It's, uh, of course, it has to be used smartly, and when people do things that are bad, they need to be caught and punished and, and fined for them. But if the council was doing that, I think they'd find CCTV pretty effective. And just this last matter, there were, there were figures out uh, this week uh, freedom, under Freedom of Information which showed that the struggle that London authorities have hitting their own targets for, for affordable um, homes now, what is Barnett's target? Do you know what their target is? Some I don't know what their know. target is, but we but certainly have a, a robust building programme, probably the biggest in London, and so we are playing our part within Barnet. But it comes down to the issue, once again, of immigration. More people want to come into the capital, whether from inside this country or from uh, abroad, so we need to vote to come out of the European Union. Briefly, 20 seconds uh, left, Stephen, but people were saying when they looked at the figures, you know, no-one had got anywhere near getting 50% affordability. That's what Sadiq Khan says is possible. It, it, it is. It's a big task that Sadiq has set. He's absolutely right to put it at the top of his agenda. It's a massive crisis facing the whole of London. And we shall see what he does. Up to you both. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you.